what's coming to CES 2019, and more coming up on today's episode of the latest in tech news. Hey Gadget here, you're just in time for the latest episode of the world's only 3-in-1 show on everything tech, gadgets, and gaming news. If you're new here, click on that subscribe button right now so that you don't miss out on an episode and, or, or tap, I don't know, whatever device you're listening to this on. My name is Taylor Merrick, and I'll be your host. Now, let's see what the latest in tech news is. First up, CES 2019 is coming. What is that, you ask? The Consumer Electronics Show. After the glittery balls have dropped, New Year's resolutions have been made. That means it's time for the world's biggest tech companies, startups, journalists, and random celebrities to swarm upon the Las Vegas Convention Center for this year's Consumer Electronics Show. Now, this isn't open to the public, so the public can't show up. So this is great for journalists and, and tech companies and startups, because we can all go there and have a party. Um, whatever party I guess you want to have. Uh, <laughs> hopefully it's just electronics and technology-related stuff, but... Um, this is a week-long showcase of every gadget you could ever dream of, spread out across a sprawling convention center and glitzy casinos, robots, wacky VR headsets, smart mattresses, TVs, AI-powered appliances, self-driving vehicles, and even some zany concepts that will shape consumer tech in years to come. This is where tech companies come to show the world what they've got in store. Now, um, although on a side note, it seems like more and more cars keep showing up, so is this the consumer electronics and car auto show? I I don't I don't know. We'll uh, we'll find out. So obviously I'm not at CES. It's the weekend before. I'm sitting here in my studios in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, hoping and waiting for the day that I can finally go to CES and find some awesome companies of my own. I have a couple of friends I know who are going out to CES and they've done it many times over the years. Um, obviously I'm just a small company, but I. That's definitely on my bucket list and something I would love to do to get you guys the latest and greatest information seen as how the general public can't even buy a ticket to go. And tickets are in the hundreds of dollars and that's not even, you're not even considering the airfare and the hotel, all the other fun stuff that goes along with it. But yeah, CES 2019, Gizmodo obviously will be there and that's where this article is coming from. So uh, they have a team of grizzled gadget bloggers ready to descend on the show floor to pick the coolest gadgets of the bunch. And according to Gizmodo, and, and it seems like a general trend for CES 2019, um, here's the trends that we're expecting to come out of this year's event. First up, voice assistants still rule the smart home. Obviously, Google will be there. Obviously, Amazon will be there. They'll be showing off their smart speakers, their Alexas, their assistants, and saying, mine's cooler, mine's better, mine can speak in a British accent. And, uh, well, last year, sleep tech and better Amazon integrations were the focus of smart home improvements. This year, you can expect more of the same towards wellness and convenience with just a slight tweak. In addition to Amazon Alexa, we'll see a greater showing of devices that work with Google Assistant, and that extends to gadgets for every room in the house. We're talking high-tech baby monitors, doorbells, and smarter bathroom fixtures. Wellness tech, that's more than skin deep. No joke, people are stressed. And while wearables like smartwatches and fitness tractors were... <laughs> tractors, yeah. <laughs> yeah, see a smart tractor there, that'd be incredible. Uh, fitness trackers were thought to lead the wellness tech category. In recent years, wellness has taken on a new track at CES. In 2018... We uh, looked at a connected aromatherapy diffuser and a machine that could print you customized shampoo based on your hair makeup. This year, we're expecting a little more when it comes to skin care. We saw some devices like a tiny UV tracker from L'Oreal last year, and in 2019, expect to see more personalization via tech that can scan your skin and recommend regimens based on your unique needs. So, something interesting there. That said, don't count wrist-based wearables out. Fossil always has a massive showing for their stylish Wear OS watches, and Amron will be there with their blood pressure smartwatch. Now, TVs. What are we looking at here? Oh, by the way, if you're listening to this as a podcast right now, you can actually watch the video of this over on Facebook.com forward slash Tech News Gadget or YouTube.com forward slash Tech News Gadget. We're looking at a gorgeous 8K TV on the screen right now, but... um. Seeing as they're making another showing again this year, do they have HDMI 2.1? Well, let's see. Dazzling TVs have always been a staple of CES, and that's not going to change in 2019. Uh, yesterday, I covered a monitor, a nice 
what 49 inch curved monitor exclusively for gaming that samsung is unveiling the tease before the, the event you can't count on all the players being there lg samsung sony pcl hisense to roll out some literally their biggest baddest 8k displays even if there isn't much 8k content out there at the moment to justify them well they're going to show them off nonetheless because why not but how can you actually buy 8k tvs if your wallet is deep enough uh, the thing you want to keep an eye on is how many TV makers will adopt HDMI 2.1. Now, while most TVs currently use HDMI 2.0, 2.1 has a lot more bandwidth and can support frame rate up to 120 frames per second and resolutions of up to 10K. So, it's kind of, to go without saying, um, HDMI 2.0 might work for the, the 8K connection, but it would work easier if it was HDMI 2.1. So, check to make sure the TVs have it. Not that anyone needs that just yet, but something to keep an eye on. Also, seeing as how the big trend overall this year as uh, phone manufacturers and telecommunication companies are gearing up to release 5G and networks and phones and devices and smart stuff all over the place, well, 5G will most likely be all over the show floor. I'm even sitting in the corner crying with uh, no display case up because their shipment got lost in transport. That's what happened last year. Uh, rumor and speculation. <laughs> It happens. Anyways, in case you haven't heard yet and you're living under a rock, 5G is coming. Carriers have already started that in small test areas, and manufacturers like Samsung, OnePlus, and Xiaomi have teased the idea of 5G-capable phones, although it probably won't be announcing more or releasing some to the general public till probably more summer or fallish. That's what I'm generally thinking of here. Um, there'll be a lot of 5G-related gizmos on the floor. Expect to see... 5G pop-up in keynotes, especially in relation to smart cities, self-driving cars, and Internet of Things devices. Wouldn't be surprised to see some 5G hotspots and routers either. And uh, then we'll see the miscellaneous incremental and unexpected. Now while these are some of the bigger trends, there are even more incremental improvements that we haven't covered. Things like USB-C headphones, tweaks to self-driving car concepts, coding robots for kids, wireless charging, super thin bezels for gaming PCs, Vendi phone prototypes and probably some more lackluster AR VR headsets. And you can always count on CES for things that always don't fit into the larger scheme of things like wonky scooters, bad booths, bulletproof pantyhose. Apparently, you never know when you might need one. And maybe a power outage or two. Seeing as how it draws a lot of power, uh, you can probably count on the Las Vegas Convention Center uh, powering down a couple of times or a couple sections uh, throughout the whole entire week. So, what are you looking forward to? at CES 2019 or hope that you hear more about. Be sure to leave a comment or uh, let us know on Twitter at Tech News Gadget. Oh, you weren't supposed to see that. <laughs> I was supposed to do click on to the next scene before I did eh, whatever. So, in gaming news, we're looking at Hitman Absolution and Blood Money, the remasters arriving January 11th. They're also including 4K support, so Following the success of Hitman and Hitman 2, Warner Brothers and IO Interactive are looking to strike while enthusiasm is high by releasing a remastered collection of the older games in the series. The Hitman HD Enhanced Collection will include Hitman Absolution and Hitman Blood Money, and it will be available on PS4 and Xbox One on January 11th for about 60 bucks US. Now there's no word yet on a PC release date, however, depends on how the port's going and if they're able to get the bugs figured out is most likely what I'm thinking. You'll be able to play them in 4K resolution on the uh, PS4 Pro and Xbox One X and at 60 frames per second while lighting, textures, shadow, and controls have been updated. While Absolution and Blood Money perhaps aren't as highly regarded as Hitman and Hitman 2, series newcomers might be interested to check out the older series for the first time just to figure out who the heck is this bald guy, why does he wear a suit, why is his tie red, and why does he always have a gun, and what's with the barcode on the back of his head. You'll find out all of that. So, there you have it. All right, so you remember yesterday I was talking about the uh, Madbox gaming console. Well, we finally have a first look at the new Madbox gaming console design. This was just released on Twitter between the last episode and this episode about a day-ish, not even. Um, a new standalone video console called the Madbox to rival the PlayStation and Xbox has now been revealed on Twitter by... Um, well, the CEO of Madbox Studios. And let's see. You want to see the picture? Here it is. Ooh. 
console resembles a PC with an M-shaped tower and the Slightly Mad Studios logo etched on one side. The system's internal components have been blurred out in images, however, as Bell says, the CEO, that the team is still in discussion regarding that. He also notes this is not the final design, so it could be uh, changing. According to Bell, the Mad Box is very light and it features a deplorable... Deplorable. Wow. Okay, the word that I thought I'd erased from 2016 vocabulary just came jumping back in. Deployable carry handle on the top so that you can easily transport it. He also says the system will talk to other mad boxes without cables, though he didn't really elaborate much further on that. Bell claims the mad box is the most powerful console ever built, featuring specs that will be, quote, equivalent to a very fast PC two years from now, what I covered yesterday. Speaking with Variety, he said the system will support most major VR headsets and allow up to 60 frames per second per eye for virtual reality play. He also says the system will offer 4K visuals. Pricing and release details for the Madbox have yet to be announced, but the system will ship around the world in about three years and be, quote, competitive with upcoming console prices. So, there you have it. You got a little tease at the Madbox a little bit more, and uh, we'll just have to wait and see more to come. In tech news, well, Amazon has to say it, Amazon has sold 100 million Alexa devices. So, what's next? Well, seeing as how Amazon um, isn't going to be the only person there on the display floor on CES, S, um, well, Google is going to be in for a surprise. More than 100 million devices with Alexa on board have been sold. That's the all-too-rare actual number that Amazon's SVP of Devices and Services, David Limp, revealed earlier this week. That's not to say Amazon has finally decided to be completely transparent about device sales, however. When a company claims it outstripped its most optimistic expectations for the Echo Dot during the holiday season, he wouldn't give a number for that either. Instead, he says Amazon is sold out of dots through January, despite, quote, pushing pallets of Echo Dots on the 747s and getting them from Hong Kong to here as quickly as we possibly could. So... It was kind of pretty impressive there, but back to that 100 million number. Depending on how you count, it's either seriously impressive or a serious problem for Amazon. On the one hand, 100 million pales in comparison to the number of phones that have either Siri or Google Assistant pre-installed. On the other hand, the word pre-installed is the key thing to pay attention to here. With Alexa devices, you could argue consumers are making an active choice to purchase an assistant instead of just getting a default. Now, it's been a while since we had a good old-fashioned dot knock down, drag out, winner take all platform war, but there might be one brewing right now in the world of intelligent assistants. As in any platform war, the numbers come out front and center, and Amazon has the lead on many of those numbers, more than 150 products with Alexa built in, more than 28,000 smart home devices that work with Alexa, made by more than 4,500 different manufacturers and over 70,000 Alexa skills developers. The numbers for Google Assistant were lower across the board last time we heard them, but it's likely Google will use CES 2019 to check in with new ones, so we'll have to wait to see on that. Now, how Amazon got to those numbers is a lot more interesting than the numbers themselves. Amazon's strategy for Alexa reveals a fundamental philosophy. Speak softly and empower everyone to just ship. Now, is this really a platform war? Well, so it might not be, but, uh, but it might actually play out differently from platform wars of the past. According to the uh, Amazon SVP, he says, I don't think it falls into a sporting event where there's going to be one winner. I think there will be multiple players for the foreseeable future. I don't think it's going to be only two either. I think there will be more than that. Well, could just be an executive statement. Why start a fight if you don't have to? But having talked about this since the early days, it could be part of the character of the SVP, the laid-back executive who is remarkably candid, pragmatic, and almost chill about other issues that other executives would dance around. But he's not too worried, so we'll just have to see how this pans out. Did you pick up a knock Echo Dot over the weekend? Do you know why you picked it up? Did you pick it up because you wanted Alexa on it? Or did it come pre-installed? Or uh, was it because you didn't want the other option? I don't know. Be sure to let me know down in comments. So, we've been talking a lot about gadgets. And yes, we have more gadget news. Uh, this one is uh, the title. This comes to us from Wired. By the way, if you want the show notes for this episode, if you're listening to the podcast, all you have to do is scroll up an app that you're using to listen to it, and you'll have the show notes right at your fingertips. You can tap over to the article 
But if you're watching this video or, or hearing about it somewhere else, head on over to technewsgadget.net forward slash 75 to get the show notes for this episode. And uh, this one is saying to give yourself to the dark mode side. Ooh, a play on words here and a little bit of Star Wars. So what are we talking about here? This article, like most of the internet, is presented to you via black text on a white background. And if you're listening to the audio, you're hearing the audio version of it. But the see the video, it has white text. Uh, I mean, black text, the white background. Uh, depending on what time of day it is and how long you've been staring at an obnoxiously bright screen, you might find the experience of reading it a bit eh, aggravating, perhaps even exhausting. But don't worry, you're not alone. While Wired is, of course, a beautifully designed site, we spend most of our day staring at bright white screens dotted with color words and images that can quickly take a toll on our poor old eyes. Nearly 60% of the American adults surveyed by the Vision Council, which represents members of the optical industry, reported experiencing symptoms of digital eye strain. So, enter dark mode, often referred to as night mode, high contrast, or inverted colors. The setting has grown popular with those who claim to experience eye fatigue from a deluge of white screens. Dark mode is an eye-friendly alternative to the traditional blindingly bright user interfaces supported by most apps, sites, and platforms. Instead of featuring a predominantly white background with black text, the typical dark mode displays a black background with white or colored text, making it easier to, say, read your own tweets silently to yourself at 3 a.m. without feeling like you're staring directly into the sun, or just reading your Kindle book without having, you know, burn your eyeballs out like you're looking at fire. Difficult to pinpoint when exactly our rebellion against blinding white screens began. Over the years, many popular apps, sites, and operating systems have released darker versions of their traditional themes and layouts in an attempt to satiate light-averse users and make products more accessible to the visually impaired. Technically, it's not rebellion at all, but it's more of a throwback. The displays of early terminal and personal computers in the 60s and 70s bear a stark resemblance to the predominantly black, high-contrast themes popular today. So is it making a comeback like the hairdo of the 80s? I don't know. It remains to be seen. One of the first modern operating systems to offer a darker alternative to the black on white theme was Apple System 7 OS, which debuted in 1991 and featured an inverted color scheme for the visually impaired. Named Close View, the optional accessibility program allowed users to toggle between the traditional black on white theme and a more moody white on black one. So obviously, Microsoft didn't want to be outdone, so they released Windows 95 and had that option, and it's kind of continued on ever since. So, the point of this article. You know, it's essentially, well, you could go on and read more of it if you, if you want to. Um, the general controls offered by your operating system are likely your best bet. Both Windows 10 currently and Mac OS Mojave, Mo, Mojave? I, I'm going to say it. I, you know, I, I didn't grow up in a desert. I didn't grow up in, in that state, so I'm probably going to murder it. Uh, now boast official dark mode settings and allow for the integration of third-party apps and programs, meaning it'll likely get easier to live in digital darkness as time goes on. Microsoft Office already offers support for Windows Dark Mode, and the next version of Chrome OS will reportedly work with both operating systems' nighttime themes eventually. Facebook, platform ruler of the Whitespace Kingdom, is even reportedly testing a darker mode feature for Messenger. So if you ever have a problem or your eyes are strained or something, well, you know, m might do you some good to switch it to dark mode just to ease your eyes off. Or, or here's what you could do actually turn off your app, turn off your phone, turn off the TV and everything. Let your eyes settle and adjust to the darkness in the evening, 15 minutes before you go to bed, and then go to bed and stay in bed and stay asleep. And go, we'll go to the bed at a decent time and then wake up when it's daytime or when you actually have to get up. You might find yourself feeling a lot better about life and in general and not you know so blue about the whole blindingly obnoxiously white screen experience. So... They have it. I've gone and done my PSA for today. Speaking of Microsoft and their ever abundant ways of giving you stuff you don't need. No, I'm kidding. Microsoft wants to kill passwords starting with Windows 10. Well, I've already figured out I, why do I have to pay extra for Office when you could just include it with the operating system. Okay, that's a question for another time. I don't know why it's a pet peeve. I had to bring it up. No, it's stupid. Okay, I'll talk about it later. Um, let's read the article, shall we? The next version of Windows 10 will support passwordless Microsoft accounts. Microsoft will just text a code to your phone uh, phone number when you sign in. It's all part of Microsoft's stated goal, a world without passwords. 
Now this feature is available now in Insider Build 18309. It will be stable and available to everyone in the next version of Windows 10, codenamed 19H1, and available sometime around April of 2019. Passwordless logins debuted for Windows 10 Home back in Insider Build 18305, but are now available on all editions of Windows. Well, how does this passwordless system work, you may ask? Well, you can now create a Microsoft account without a password. Instead, you'll just provide your phone number when you sign into Windows 10. With that phone number, Microsoft will text you a code that you enter on the sign-in screen. After that, you can use Windows Hello, which I believe is an app, to set up a PIN, fingerprint, or face login method. You'll never have to type a password. Your account doesn't even have one. And you don't have to enter a code sent via text every time you sign in either. You only have to receive a code on your phone when you sign in on a new PC. So if you're interested and you want to use this feature on the latest insider build of Windows, you'll need a Microsoft account without a password. Now, if you don't already have a passwordless phone number account, you can create one in a mobile app like Word on your iOS or Android device to try it out. Simply go to Word and sign up with your phone number by entering your phone number under sign in or sign up for free. The latest build also features a streamlined pin reset experience to Windows Hello and improvements to the narrator. So I, is this something you guys are looking forward to using passwordless? Apparently Microsoft is figuring, hey, everybody has their phone on them all the time anyways. Why don't we just give them an option <laughs> It'd be easier if they had a Windows phone, though. Ugh. Um, but it, it's okay. We got it working on Android and iOS, too. Uh, we got apps for that. Um, how about how about you just carry your phone around with you because you have it with you anyways, and this fingerprint thing really isn't working out great, and this voice recognition thing really haven't taken it too far, and we don't think it'll be easy to use, but everybody seems to use it fine for the assistance, and... Virtual AI, Amazon Alexa devices, iOS, but, but um, face recognition that has realms and problems all of its own. So let's just make it passwordless. You have your phone with you, right? Well, you should just uh, use that to log in. Kind of like two-factor authentication account. Um, kind of trying to deter, I guess, hackers in some way from being able to hack or break in, because they'll be like, "Dang it, I can't get this guy's password. He doesn't have one." Oh, maybe I should steal his phone next time. Yeah, that'll do it. I don't know. What do you guys think? I think maybe... I I mean, I can understand the intention and, the, and their stated goal about wanting to do this. It just seems, I don't know, a, a bit weird. Am I the only one who thinks about the, at this? Let me know in the comments or on Twitter, at Tech News Gadget. Um, I don't know. I, I mean, it sounds cool. I'm all for the idea. It sounds interesting. Um, But it feels like you go, okay, step, 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 wait, what? Where'd the steps go? What? It, wait, am I missing something? I mean, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm over, I could be overthinking it for as much as I know. Um, if I am, let me know. If you like this idea, let me know. And if you think it's dumb too, um, you could probably agree with me and let me know and I'd feel better about myself instead of having to cry myself silently to sleep, drowning in Mountain Dew, uh, pitch black. Not sponsored, by the way, just, you know, a handy drink nearby and me being moody about all this stuff. I'm just kidding. I'm just messing around with you guys. Let's move on to the next article, shall we? So, speaking about uh, interesting phones and things uh, being uncovered at CES 2019, is this Xiaomi's folding smartphone? Well, uh, in an image here that you can see, are three screens better than one? Foldable, mind you? A video claiming to show a phone from Xiaomi has been leaked. In the clip, what appears to be a tablet-sized device can be seen using to access Google Maps before both sides are folded backwards to give it the form factor of a compact but likely thick smartphone. In this tweet, Glass, who leaked the whole news, says he can't vouch for the leak's authenticity. Rumors from Xiaomi is working on a foldable smartphone. I've been around since 2016 and I probably blabbed about it before on this episode or show somewhere. But, um, well, this video emerged in what appears to be one of its folding screens in use. Now, if this leak is legitimate, it uh, would be joining what's expected to be an onslaught of new foldable devices to come. Samsung obviously showing off its prototype last year, uh, shortly after the Chinese company Royoli demoed a folding device of its own. 
Lenovo reported it's been working on bendable phones since back in 2016. Huawei is reportedly planning to launch one this year. And Apple's been quieter about its ambitions for a folding phone, but patent applications suggest it's exploring the concept at least. Now, what's interesting is that well, at least half a dozen companies are working on a foldable smartphone. Each of them have a different idea about the design. The device that Samsung showed off on stage had two screens, a large one on the inside and a smaller one on the outside for use when folded. The company has also filed patents for many more designs, including ones with a single screen that folds once or even twice, like the reported Xiaomi Foldable that you just saw. Now, we've seen enough leaked videos over the years that this latest one is hardly confirmation of a new folding smartphone. However, with so many of its Chinese competitors reportedly preparing to release phones in 2019 and companies looking to differentiate themselves in this plateauing smartphone market and fears of whatever Apple's smartphone market starting to lose hold and sales not doing great this year, last quarter, quarter before, and trying to figure out why have we reached peak smartphones? I don't know. Xiaomi is unlikely to be too far behind in this race to figure out, hey, I got something different here. This is cool. Buy my phone. And then smash it in half because I dropped it two inches. And it just shattered into a million pieces. So, if you're wondering, Xiaomi is due to host a press conference on January 10th where it's expected to announce that Xiaomi is turning its Redmi range into a separate sub-brand. Perhaps it'll have a couple surprises coming up? We'll see. So you guys love esports, right? If you're listening to this, you're probably at least a fan, if not more of a fan than I am. Um, well, esports teams, being as they are from various parts of the world and various age ranges, uh, do you remember hearing about the one that uh, debuted, what was this, in 2016, the uh, girls only uh, League of Legends esports team? Well, that one didn't last too long. That kind of actually crashed and burned miserably in a spectacular ball of flame. You never hear about it anymore, but yes, it actually happened. But I keep running across the YouTube suggested videos for it every so often. I don't want to see it. I already saw it. Uh, there's nothing new since then. But this, this article may wet your whistle. The world's oldest esports team is gaining their way to longer lives. Now, um, that's the title for this article. And while you might be like, well, this is a little bit cryptic and vague and maybe it could have been done better. Well, let's actually get into the meat of the article and find out what it's all about. Uh, the article begins as follows. At a row of computers, the team sits, ultra-focused, fingers flying over the keyboard. The video game Counter-Strike plays out on their monitors as they communicate over headsets, engaged in fierce competition at Moscow's Iromir Expo, Russia's largest computer and video game convention. But this is not your average group of gamers. The slogan on her black jacket reads, We've got time to kill. With an average age of 67, the Silver Snipers from Stockholm, Sweden are the oldest esports team in the world. We want to win, so we have to train a lot, said team member Iger Grottenbald, 66, nicknamed Trigger Finger. But she doesn't mind. The team is so close to each other, we know each other very well. Oh look, there's a picture that goes along with this too. What? Old people playing video games? And this is an e No, I'm not making this up. This is an actual article. Sponsored by tech company Lenovo, the five silver snipers travel across Europe for Counter-Strike tournaments playing against teams from around the globe. They train in Stockholm with their coach, 38-year-old Tommy Potty Igni Marsen, a 10-time Counter-Strike world champion. And I probably murdered his name. For those of you who follow the esports teams in Counter-Strike, I'm sorry. My apologies. I'll just call him Potty. Um... I get it. I get. See, I get why they're called the Silver Snipers, because all their hair is gray or white. Get it? Get it? I mean silver. Ugh. Flubbed on that joke. Sorry. Okay, back to the article. Last fall's world tour, their first, also included stops in Paris and Finland. Uh, the hope the team can score invitations to upcoming competitions in South America. Esports is a, quote, lovely community to be in, Grunblad at said, adding that before she started playing, I guess this is a spokesperson for the team, she thought it was young guys sitting at home playing games all night long, but she and the team found something unexpected, a welcoming community and a loyal legions of fans to cheer them on. It's very lovely because you could be treated like, go away, she said. Instead, they are opening their arms to us and say, oh, you're so cool. As a matter of fact, my grandson say you're the coolest grandmother in the world. Yeah, how would you like to have your grandmother on the esports team? She's like, yeah, I play Counter-Strike. I whoop them. But, yeah, 
I was trying to put words into a joke or something. It's just hilarious. I love it. But I'm not making any of this up. This is actually true. It's happening right now. The esports community is just one benefit for these senior gamers. The social engagement with each other is good for their health, too. Front and bottom has formed a close friendship with teammate Monica Einford, age 62, nicknamed Teen Slayer. Oh, gosh. How would you love to be like, yeah, my grandma's IGN is Teen Slayer because she kicks people's butt. She doesn't even use an aimbot. It might sound simple, but happiness and fun are proven to have measurable impacts on our health and longevity. One study found that older people were up to 35% less likely to die during the five-year research period if they reported feeling happy, excited, and content on a typical day. Um, doesn't seem like the uh, norm when you're in a nursing home. <laughs> At least from what I've heard so far, you're like, nursing home is where you go to die. Wow, that's uh, really encouraging. That's what my grandpa said. We got him out of there because he didn't want to be in there in the first place, and uh, we got him a house and a place, and he was in much better off spirits, and uh, I think everybody felt better after that, too. On top of that, concentrating on the game keeps their minds active. The brains form new neural connections, an ability known as neuroplasticity, that could help slowing some of the mental effects of aging. So, there it is. There's a whole picture of the whole squad. So, when it comes to the older population in his gaming studies, um or in studies that have gone by. Um, there is a heightened level of enthusiasm, and, uh, quote, in our experience, it makes them excited and optimistic that they can engage in technology and get good at it. With the Silver Snipers, Runblood has noticed a personal change, too. I keep my brain alert, she said. It's a big difference. I keep my hands very, very alert, too, because you have to be rapid in your movements with your hands. You have to have that whole uh, hand-eye coordination connection, uh, the muscle memory, all of that. You have to coordinate what you're doing without thinking what you're doing. Still, moderation is important when it comes to video games. These games are designed to be really enjoyable and sticky. Human nature in many ways is to find something you enjoy and just keep doing it. But I do believe you have to fight against those habit-forming activities and find diversity. Moderation is the main thing. For the Silver Snipers, it's all about creating a balance while improving focus, keeping the brains active, being social, and having fun. In many ways, they are gaming their way to longer life. Now you understand the rest of the article name. When I look in the mirror, I see all the wrinkles, she said, but I don't feel old. I feel like I've always been. Sometimes I feel like I'm 25 when I'm laughing too much, and she's probably like, Ah, oh, I just pounced some noobs. Grandma, don't say that. That's the end of that, sucker. Hey, if you understood where that reference was from, let me know in the comment section, because, um, man, that was perfectly timed. It's from a YouTube video uh, from a YouTube personality. You got it? I'm not giving away the answer. You gonna have to leave me a comment if you don't know uh, and if you do know post a question and see if uh see if you're right wrong or otherwise because i'll be keeping an eye on the chat and letting you know if you got it right or wrong let's move on to the next article so one uh, thing that has been teased early ahead of ces 2019 was d-link's new 5g wi-fi router uh, that could technically let you say goodbye to cable internet forever now, unless you spent 2018 living in a cave, you've undoubtedly heard the buzz around a new 5G wireless networks coming online. They're not only promising faster internet speeds for mobile devices, but wireless internet that's actually fast enough to completely replace the wired broadband you use at home. With D-Link's new 5G NR router, all you need is electricity and a SIM card to say goodbye to cable forever. Interesting concept to think about. Let's see what this article is going to go on to say. It's safe to assume that eventually every device in your home, from TVs to smartphones to voice-activated microwaves, will each directly connect to the next generation of cellular networks being implemented, be it 5G, 6G, or whatever number of series the future holds. But that's still a few years away and will require you to upgrade every Internet of Things device you use. Smartphones and tablets will be among the first to offer 5G compatibility, with others eventually following suit. But you don't upgrade your dishwasher as often as you do your phone, and that's where a 5G router would be a useful upgrade. You see, instead of plugging D-Link's DWR 2010 5G NR router into a prehistoric coaxial cable, or even a network cable, if you're blessed with a fiber connection to your home, it will simply suck high-speed internet from the sub 6 GHz and millimeter wave frequencies that 5G will rely on, and distribute it amongst all the connected devices in your home using the tried-and-true local Wi-Fi network they are already designed to connect to. Now, the D-Link DWR 2010 isn't expected to arrive until the latter half of 2019, and it will be sold through the various cellular carriers in the country who will dictate pricing. Now, the hardware will undoubtedly be subsidized in exchange for multi-year 
Ethernet plan contract, but it will be powered by Qualcomm Snapdragon X55 chipset, will include 5 gigabit Ethernet ports, ideal for gaming or connecting in NAS, as well as AC2600 dual band Wi-Fi that also supports connectivity to D-Link mesh networking products for extending your wireless network to every last corner of your home, which for some people is strange because you're like, I live in an apartment or I live in a building or a house small enough where I can essentially walk halfway down the block before the Wi-Fi signal conks out. So I don't know really why do I need all this stuff. Anyways, this is for people who have big homes. Okay. Um, now, is the technology worth jumping on right away? Probably not, as it will certainly take a few years for 5G coverage to match the reach of 4G networks right now. But if you happen to live somewhere where reliable broadband connectivity has been hard to come by, 5G maybe, possibly, could finally solve your connectivity woes. So, there you have it, good, bad, or otherwise, 5G is on the way and it's popping up in routers. Ah, jeez. Alright, and as for the last article that I have for you guys today, Epic is bringing back 14 days of Fortnite. Um, I guess they flubbed on that. So, uh, I guess they're bringing it back, the whole thing, the whole whole entire event. So if you happen to miss it the first time or, or, or you didn't get all of the achievements completed the first time around, um, you have a second chance. You see, on January 2nd, Epic Games announced they would be compensating players with the Equalizer Glider as long as they completed one of the 14 challenges a part of 14 days of Fortnite. Two days later, today, they decided to allow all players a chance to complete every 14 days of Fortnite challenge. So, they're restarting the whole entire thing. Um, we'll be bringing back this event next week through January 15th at 3 a.m. Eastern Time, or 1800 UTC. So... Yeah, the whole entire thing, all 14 days will be available and all the challenges you've missed out on or, or, or missed or whatever. You'll be able to do that all over again. Now, each challenge completed would reward players with an in-game item, emote, spray, or emoticon. Players were originally under the impression that they could complete the challenges until the event's end date. However, the event ended abruptly on January 1st and people were like, well, what's going on? And, um, well, you now have until January 15th to complete all of those challenges and I actually have a link to uh, the article of this website and on there they have it for each and every day what you have to do for all the 14 challenges it looks like on one you have to visit the candy cane uh, play matches with friends you have to cough with a muted microphone I think I need something to drink I'm probably getting close to the end of this episode what do you guys think we probably wrap it up yeah uh, and then there's searching chests and thank the bus driver and doing all this stuff. So all those challenges, all the links will be available in the show notes for today's episode. That will bring us to the end of today's episode. By the way, if you happen to miss something on the show or something that you want us to keep you informed on, be sure to let us know on Twitter at Tech News Gadget. We also have a community over at technewsgadget.net forward slash forum where you can hang out with other people and talk about tech or gaming or gadgets or whatever else you guys are interested in. By the way, if you happen to enjoy this episode, be sure to leave a like and be sure to tell a friend. That will do it for this episode of the Latest in Tech News. I'm your host, Taylor Merrick, for the Latest in Tech, Gadgets, and Gaming News. Be sure to head on over to technewsgadget.net. Pretty much, keep being awesome, guys, and I'll see you on the flip side.